archiving started. Hello and welcome to lecture number four for Engineering Economy. Uh, this is the lecture that would have been given live on Thursday, May 10th, but instead we're recording it. First, to do a couple of announcements. Please remember that homework number one is due by five o'clock and uh, you can slide that under my office door and I'm going to connect that, uh, collect that later in the afternoon. Uh, on Friday, it's my intention to return your homework graded. Um, it, it might be after class on Friday that I actually get around to grading that, but we'll see. What is certain is that you'll have a quiz on Friday and that quiz is going to cover some basic concepts from the homework assignment that you submit on uh, Thursday afternoon, and then also it's going to cover some of the material from this Wimble lecture. Um, and homework number two is due on Monday. I've posted homework number two on MU Online, a PDF of it, and I'm also going to email a copy so that everyone has that available to print and to begin working on. Uh, homework number two is covering some of the concepts in Chapter 3, which is what we're going to begin today. Um, so you should print out a copy of the notes that go along with this lecture. Again, that is also found on MU Online, along with the in-class exercise for today. And I also intend to attach both of those two PDFs to the email announcing that this archive is available. So print those notes and don't look too closely at the example quite yet. You know, there's an example solution embedded in the notes, but <clears throat> I'd prefer that you try working that your own before you look at the solution to it. This is a chart that shows the cost of gasoline in the United States over the last several years. And so take a moment to look at that. So if you're like me, probably what your eye turns to is the winter of 2008. And right as the um, 2008 was drawing to a close. There was a financial crisis, of course, and for a lot of people, there was concern that maybe the economy, the global economy was going to collapse along with the, uh, the end of credit availability because of uh, the collapse of a couple of banks and brokerage firms. And so because world economic output declined, there was less demand for gasoline, the manufacturers and producers of gasoline weren't able to charge as much for it, and so the price dropped. And remember, in our previous lecture, we've talked about the relationship between price and demand, and when demand decreases, then price um, has to follow. Over time, of course, it's crept back up, and nowadays the price of gasoline uh, is up around $4 a gallon. Uh, but the reason why I show it to you is that we're going to be looking at some techniques today for estimating costs. When we're planning a project, we have to project what we think the expenses of that project might be, even though we don't necessarily have firm quotes from all of our suppliers. You generally, when you get a quote from a supplier, it'll say right on the quote that it's maybe valid for 30 days or 60 days, but people don't want to commit to far in the future of what they're going to charge you for a certain item because their costs might change. And so when we're planning a project that may be several years in the future, one of the techniques that we can use for uh, determining a budget is to look at historically in the past how prices have changed and then to extrapolate that forward into the future. So that's one of the techniques we'll take a look at today. And uh, this figure sort of sets the stage for that. And uh, I'm going to hope that the price of gasoline follows more of the, uh, the trend, <laughs> this trend, rather than this trend going into the future, although probably that's a little bit unrealistic. Chapter three is uh, important because it sets the stage for a lot of the other things that we're going to be covering, obviously, in the rest of the course. Um, chapter four is really the heart of the course, and that's when we start talking about the time value of money. But before we can project present costs into the future or annual cost to the present or future cost to the present, we have to have an understanding for um, developing the cash flow diagrams that will then be converted into different time frames. And so chapter four is a little bit about time travel, converting the future cost of money to present costs and vice versa. But before we can do that time travel, we have to know um, what costs are to be converted. 
And so that's the purpose of chapter three. It's a model or a technique for estimating what the costs will be. And so um, we can apply the principles of cost estimating both to incomes and expenses. And we can use these techniques to estimate what sort of revenues may be generated by a, an investment or an expansion of a business. And we can also use these to estimate what the costs of producing a good or a service or the cost of a project might be. In cost estimation, the information that is gathered can be used for uh, sitting, uh, setting a selling price for items. Um, often a contractor will have to supply a bid and you know, whoever, whichever contract, contractor submits the lowest bid often gets the work. And so for them to know how much they should bid, they have to have a pretty detailed idea of all of the components that go into the project. Um, and sometimes even before attempting a line of business, a producer will use the principles of cost estimating to find out if they can compete. And an example of that is in the tablet market. There are a lot of electronics manufacturers who will add up the components inside of a tablet and try and decide if they can make a profit or if they would have to sell them at a loss. And uh, Apple is sort of famous for squeezing expenses out of their suppliers and um, keeping the lion's shares of the profit. And uh, a lot of people have gone out of business trying to keep up with Apple and their tablets. Uh, other uses of cost estimating is trying to figure out expenses and then if you know what the expenses are, then you can find out how much of an investment is justified to potentially capture a revenue stream. And then cost estimating, if you, at the beginning of a project, uh, come up with a reliable and logical guess of how much the project may cost, then as the project is actually occurring, then you can measure the efficiency of the project relative to that preliminary estimate. And so it can be used a, as a benchmark for judging productivity. The two primary methods of cost estimation as described in the book, and uh, just as a reminder, chapter three is as good a reading as chapter two was, and I could tell from the quiz last time that uh, several of you had actually been reading the text, and that was wonderful. But um, the book goes into uh, some additional detail beyond what's on the slide here, that in the top-down approach, what you're trying to do is use the historical data to extrapolate into the future. So in a top-down approach, I think that uh, in the example of firewood, maybe some of you went online and found out that you know a typical um, home needs a, a wood stove of a certain size, and uh, in in the past it cost a thousand dollars, and so you know that gives you an idea of how much a wood stove might cost now. Uh, the the top-down approach is just a, a method of um, finding out how previous experiences similar to yours in whole have cost or have performed. So it's sort of a, a broad estimate with not a lot of specific details in it. The bottom-up approach does have those details. It's a way of estimating costs by looking at all of the components that go into the project and breaking the components into subcomponents and finding out what their expenses and so forth are. And so a top-down approach would be when a contractor comes and just gives you an eyeball estimate, you know, your driveway looks about twice as big as the one I did last week and I had to charge 5,000 for that, so 10,000. Whereas a bottom-up approach to cost estimating would be where a contractor would actually use a, a measuring wheel you get the dimensions of the driveway, then think about how much asphalt is needed, how much of a subgrade is needed, the excavation that may be required. And so it's more detailed. And, and typically bottom-up um, estimates will be more accurate, although they take more effort to generate. And that effort takes time and time is money. So here's an example of using the top-down approach. If you were to look at uh, a particular university and they publish annual average costs. And most universities do that. They say, on average, our students 
have a cost of let's say uh, fifteen thousand seven hundred and fifty, and and they'll list what is is included in that estimate. In this case, maybe it's tuition and fees, housing, weekly meal plan, and then if you looked over the last several years, maybe you could notice that the costs had increased at six percent per year. So what you could do is you could extrapolate into the future how much that's going to cost, and also by adding the other expenses, maybe if if you knew that you would want to include some travel, entertainment, clothing, and so forth. And so what a top-down approach to estimating the total cost of an education would look like is on screen there. In year one, you'll notice that they've multiplied the tuition by 1.06. And the reason for that is it was this year that the costs were 15,750. And if you're going to school next year, then you have to assume the worst that the costs and the expenses have gone up. And so in year one, it's 16,695. And then in year two, uh, it's again multiplied by 1.06 because it's 6% higher than it was the year before that. It looks like the other expenses, we haven't had any kind of an increase over time for those. So by just not breaking it up into any subcomponents other than tuition fees, room and board, and other expenses. We haven't got more detailed than that. We're able to very quickly and um, easily come up with a grand total of $93,000 for total cost, which is a lot, right? Thankfully, I think Marshall tuition is lower than that. A bottom-up approach to the same question if you were going to break the cost of, um, of expenses, uh, education expenses, rather than just relying on the university's typical student costs, what you do is for every year, you'd find out how much you were going to pay in tuition and fees. And maybe rather than just saying tuition and fees, you'd actually break it down into the subcomponents there because as you may know, some students at Marshall who have a lot of lab courses have to pay fees for those lab courses and the costs are a little bit higher in some colleges than in others. Um, the same is true, I think, of the books. Um, if you've taken chemistry, I think you know the chemistry book is very expensive, but there are some other courses where their book might just be a couple of paperback novels. And so by using a bottom-up approach, you're able to put together a cost estimate that more accurately uh, reflects the costs that you actually anticipate, although um, it can be time-consuming to generate a bottom-up estimate for multiple colleges. If you're going to apply to six or seven different universities, then it would be really challenging to take the bottom-up approach, um, where maybe a top-down approach would give you pretty close to the right answer for a lot less work as an initial screening. There is a technique for generating projected cash flows and estimating expenses, an integrated approach that uh, correlates the expense estimations to a plan of work. The plan of work is called a work breakdown structure, and you'll probably learn more, more about these kinds of techniques in project management. But the idea that we need to be aware of is that there are people in a company, whether it's a, a services company or uh, a consumer products or an industrial products company, there are people who are planning projects. And in each step of the project, there are costs that go along with that. And so if we, doing the engineering economy, are able to assign a value to the individual components at each step along the way, then we can find out where the expenses are going to be and come up with estimates. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the subcomponents there are to come up with uh, estimating techniques or models, and the estimating models can be based on data that has come from previous projects. Uh, accounting departments can provide um, past uh, data to past revenues, information on expenses from the past. And so having some sort of pool of data and way of projecting from that past data to the future is the estimating model that you can use. This is a general diagram of a work breakdown structure. And any task is broken up into subtasks. And so level one is perhaps build a building. 
Level two would be uh, pour the foundation, frame the building, and you know, put up the walls. And each one of those can be broken down into um, its components. And those components can be broken up into subcomponents and so on. There's an infinite level, uh, number of sublevels uh, down to instructions for each person who are, who's working on the, the project. The more levels of detail that you have in a work break, breakdown structure, the more time it's going to take to generate an estimate. In a construction project as complex as building a building, if you were keeping track of the daily work of each person on the job, then it would be very challenging to generate a cost estimate based on that level of detail. But if you break it up into less fine pieces, such as shown here, a commercial building project where you're uh, breaking it into foundation, exterior, interior, and then you have a general idea of the subtasks under there, um, that level of detail may be easier for you to find out. Just as, for example, uh, under mechanical systems, you can find out typically for a building of the size that you're going to construct how much heating, cooling, hot water, laboratories, um, those sorts of things cost. And so it's sort of like doing a top-down approach, but with more detail than just a top-down approach at the level one. The integrated approach to cost estimating, this is a flow chart that shows what the planning process would be. And um, in the planning process, you have to uh, consider what perspective you're going to be using. So in step one is uh, you're going to generate a work breakdown structure that summarizes the tasks uh, that are, are um, have to be completed in order for the project to, to be done, breaking up into sub pieces. Now, in phase two that's shown there, essentially what you're doing is you're determining a, a baseline for measurement. You're deciding what the perspective is going to be. Um, you know, at what point in time are you comparing the costs? And um, in stage three, you're determining what level of detail should be used for the uh, estimating. For example, um, should the should the data that goes into material costs be based on quotes from several suppliers, or is it sufficient rather than doing that to just have the uh, average costs for those components over the last several projects given to you by the accounting department? Um, in stage four, you're gathering all of that information together into a single database that can be used for um, for generating costs into the work breakdown structure. And so you're assigning expenses into each of the work stages. And then at the end, um, you're applying that to all of the possible alternatives. You're comparing different types of materials. You're di comparing different types of designs. And so it's beginning to apply the decision-making process after the estimation has been generated. What's shown here, the list from 1 to 10, are different types of costs and revenues that may exist in a project. We've already seen some of this when we were considering uh, what types of things would maybe be considered direct costs versus indirect costs. Um, we talked about in class exercise about a, uh, a business that sells ice cream, what sort of expenses that they would have in terms of capital investment, maybe the freezers that they've got, or a machine that makes waffle cones. Um, we've discussed how labor costs are recurring and how in some ways it's fixed because you've got to have somebody at the store regardless of whether you're selling ice cream, but then depending on the level of activity, how it may be variable as well. So this is a list of, in most projects, there's some sort of a cost or a revenue associated with, with each one of these categories and additional description of what they all are is provided in the textbook. It's a... Uh, 
a general principle that the more accurate your estimate is going to be, the more time it takes you to generate it and the more expensive it is to, uh, to generate that. And so an order of magnitude estimate is an estimate that may be good to within 30% or even may have more error than that. An order of magnitude estimate is, if I was going to ask you, how much does it cost to make an iPad? Is it $50, $500, $5,000? $5, and sometimes you need to know an order of magnitude estimate in order just to, to throw out a, a possibility. And um, to give you an idea of an order of magnitude estimate that I saw recently is there are these little printers that will now Instead of printing with ink, they print plastic. You may have seen 3D printers before. And um, and so I'm interested in getting one. You know, it, it seems like something that would be useful to integrate into the CAD course, And but I had no idea how much they cost. Um, it turns out that they have some of them that cost between ten and $30,000, but um, some companies have come up with these 3D plastic printers now that are only $2,500, $3,000. And so um, you sometimes see technical equipment and you're really interested in it, but really don't have any sense for how much it may cost. And an order of magnitude estimate is just that easiest way of finding how much the expense is. And usually you don't have to go into too much more detail than just work breakdown structure levels one and two. The more detailed the budget is, the more accurate the projection is going to be relative to the ultimate actual cost that is born. Uh, but of course you have to go into uh, increasing levels of detail in order to achieve that improved estimate. Besides the amount of time that you have to put into generating the estimate, um, there are some things that are harder to estimate than others. And, and part of the reason for that may be variability in costs. Some costs are very stable, but some costs jump up and down a lot. Uh, the cost of copper is something that's been very um, scattered over the last several years. And I think it's particularly difficult for electricians to know what their costs may be when the price of electrical wire is jumping up and down, and mostly up. Um, but then there are some things for which the cost is relatively stable over time. Um, and where to get the data is sometimes a factor that um, determines how uh, difficult it is to generate a, a good level of accuracy. Uh, some data is readily available online. Other data is more proprietary, and you have to get a specific quotation. And, and the, the added time and expense of doing that can make it more challenging to get an accurate estimate. So, um, this is a figure that shows that the uh, estimating the cost of the project can be an appreciable cost of the project itself. This is kind of ironic that um, if you spend too much time getting quotes and trying to track down uh, the best supplier for something, you may end up spending more money trying to save a few bucks than you end up actually saving. And if you think about how some people almost obsessively shop for the best value in airfare, um, my parents do this a lot, you know, they'll uh, search online for two or three hours trying to find the cheapest airfare. And, you know, ultimately maybe they will find something that was 20 or $30 less, but and they've wasted several hours doing that, that they probably could have made more money then they end up saving. And so the corollary to that is you know, for a business that's trying to get an accurate estimate of cost, uh, sometimes having the cost estimated down to the penny is going to be so expensive to generate something with that level of accuracy that it isn't justified. So you really need to ask yourself at any particular part in the project, of how much accuracy do I actually need? Okay. One of the techniques mentioned in the book on how to estimate costs is to use uh, indexing. And at the top there is a formula that introduces the idea that you can find the cost in one year by finding out what the cost in the previous year was and then multiplying it by an index or a ratio. Um, what the index does is uh, 
this sets a baseline. It says, let's consider certain year our baseline, and then um, we will track over time how costs change relative to that baseline. <coughs> so that the index in year N relative to the index in year K becomes a multiplier. So in this example, uh, what we know is that the uh, in 1984, a baseline uh, of 100 exists for purchasing and installing a boiler. So we just say the average boiler costs 100 to do that. Now, the index itself is unitless. And in fact, the number 100 isn't particularly relevant. It may have cost more than it doesn't mean $100 or $100,000. It's just um, we're saying it is by definition 100. And so that in um, in some year in the future, in 1996, if the index value is 468, then uh, we can reference costs in the future to what the cost was in 1984. So in this example, we know that the uh, in 1996, the cost was the index value was 468. And so what is the cost of the new boiler in 2011? Um, if in 2011, we know that I'm sorry, our current, our current value is 542. So in 96, it was 468. Currently, it's uh, 542. And I guess this isn't 2011. But in the notes, I said 2011. So um, if you're looking at the example solution, what I'd like you to do is you know, picking out the index values and the cost in 96, find out what the cost in 2011 will be if, uh, if our index in 2011 is 542. So pause this and work that example. All right, so if you work that example, hopefully uh, you end up with a value of $608,013. And um, if you have any questions on how that was found, please refer to the PDF file that's there in the notes. We can take this. Um, indexing technique a step further. And the way that we do that is by considering what are called weights. And sometimes it's not just a single good that we're interested in. Uh, sometimes it's a basket of goods. And in the case of a building, you think about um, that it's not just one material that goes into a building, but there's lots of different things. And the carpet may be 1% of the total cost of a building, and maybe uh, wood is 10% of the building's cost, and um, roofing is 20% of the building's cost. And so if all of those different components are changing over time in their price, you would need to know their relative importance uh, or their relative weight in a project's cost in order to um, find an overall indexed um, cost at a certain time. And so now here in this example, what we're saying is that we know that uh, regular gasoline sells, there's three times as much uh, regular gasoline sold compared to premium or plus. And so what we could say is that W1 of being the regular gasoline, W1 is three, W2 representing the plus gas is one, and W three is also one for the premium. What we know is that uh, in 2000, and, I'm sorry, in 1992, it had the prices that are shown there. 96, we've got an idea of the prices in 2006. And so in uh, question A, what we're trying to do is find out um, what was the weighted index in 1990, I'm sorry, in 2006, when in 1992, uh, the index was 99. So we are going to multiply the index in 1992 by the relative weights multiplied by the costs in each of those years. So um, if we're going to find I sub N, where N is 2006, it's going to be I for 1992 multiplied by that weighting formula that's shown at the top. So I'll give you a few minutes to 
solve part A, which is develop a weighted index. We want to know I for 2006. Okay, so hopefully you've worked through that part A and you know that the index is 227.5. I've got the uh, calculation shown on that PDF if you want to have a glance at that, if you came up with any different answer. Moving on to part B, let's use the index for 2008. If we know that the index in 2008 is going to be 253, then how would we use the index in order to determine what the costs are? So you can find the cost in 2008 by multiplying the index in 08 divided by the index in 06 by the cost of regular. You do that, you find out that the cost of regular in 2008 will be 246 plus 256 and premium 267. So think again about why this would be used and how maybe you have seen um, weighted index like this in your own life. Um, an example that I remember from my childhood was a grocery store that I would go to had a uh, a basket suspended from the ceiling, and it, it was a basket full of lots of different things from the store. You know, it had a carton of milk, it had cereal, some vegetables, canned goods, and uh, what they had done is they had gone through their store and added up the price of all the things that were in that basket, and then they sent someone to a competitor's grocery store in town. And so they had two baskets with the same thing in it, and they said what their price was, and then they said what the price at the other place was. And they were making the point that you'd save more money if you shopped at their store than at the competitor's store. And so that basket was a weighted average. The government comes up with weighted averages as well. There's something called the Consumer Price Index, and you can find the Consumer Price Index on the Bureau of Labor and Statistics website. And I went online this evening and I looked up the uh, most recent news release for the Consumer Price Index and the nationwide uh, city prices. And what you can get a sense for there is that prices have changed slightly since the, uh, the previous quarter, and on a year-to-year -year basis they show uh, different types of items, and they also have relative weights that are listed. Um, they have an estimate of what the typical American spends on certain things. Their estimate is that, for example, the typical American spends 14% of their budget on food. And so when they're trying to come up with an index of the prices that consumers face, they would multiply the, their own um, weighted index of different subcomponents. And so they're saying for food, 14% and people spend 8% um, of their overall budget on food at home and 5.6% uh, of their uh, budget on food away from home. And so you can see it goes into additional detail for the food at home. There's a certain amount allocated for cereals and bakery, meats, poultry, fish, and so on. And then you can see how each of those things have changed over time. And it's interesting to go through that and see where the prices have increased and where the prices have decreased. Over the last 50 years, it's really remarkable how much less people spend now on their clothing than they used to. Um, you know, we spend a lot more on fuel, but a lot less on clothing, less on food. And so although prices of some things go up, prices of others decrease. And, this consumer price index is just an example of a weighted average for lots of different prices. All right, so uh, just to finish, I'd like you to apply these principles to in-class exercise number four. Uh, compared to the in-class exercise that you did last time, uh, in-class exercise two, which is where you were uh, coming up with the Excel charts, I think this is gonna be significantly simpler and probably easier for you to complete. Bring this to class with you on um, Friday, and we'll have a few moments to look over that at the beginning of class. And uh, just to glance at a few announcements once again before we finish, please remember to submit your homework assignment by 5 o'clock. 
we're going to have a quiz at the beginning of class on Friday. And um, in a compressed semester like this, where each class that we have is equivalent to two and a half class meetings in an ordinary semester, three class meetings in an ordinary semester, that means the homework uh, comes quick. And so you'll submit an assignment on Thursday and you'll have another one due on Monday. So please send me an email if you've got questions. Uh, hopefully we'll just be able to do live lectures for the rest of the semester, but I've got to say I was really pleased with um, the level of knowledge that everyone was able to display from the last member lecture. I was impressed with your maturity and actually doing your work. That's such a refreshing thing when students are responsible and um, and, uh, and learn. So thank you for that. I will see you on Friday. Thanks for listening, and please let me know if you've got any questions or concerns. Have a good night. Bye.